Today I'm presenting Teaching Methods with Ken Thompson from Musical Arts Center of San Antonio. We're going to start with the really young to the really old like me and see where I would fit as a student. <laughs> Stick around. Hi, Ted Barsalu with Alamo Piano Galleries. Look for us online at alamopianogalleries.com. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to our channel and watch some of our other videos. There's a video out with Ken Thompson, but today we're focusing on talking about teaching methods. This is Ken Thompson with the Musical Arts Center of San Antonio. Ken, welcome. Thank you so much, Ted. A pleasure to meet you. Yeah, I'm having fun yeah, getting to see good. your school, yeah, learning you. about um, all your teachers, all thank your you. students. Thank you. And like I said, I'd like to start at the beginning. So like you have young right. students. And that, what's the Very youngest? Young. And would I be the oldest student out here? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the youngest we do right now is about two and a half. Wow. Uh, well, and of course it depends. Um, uh, we always do, we like to do meet and greets to make sure we're doing a good teacher match. Right. So um, sometimes we'd be a little younger or a little older. So our youngest would be that group. And I believe, um, we have considerably older students than you. Oh. Uh, so yes, you would oh, be, be, you'd be, you'd be like, you'd be in, you'd be in the in crowd. Absolutely. Totally. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. Now, um, I wanted to talk about, because just because I guess people are introduced to music at right. a young age, uh -huh. what are some good instruments to have around, mm -hmm. say, not, you know, infant to toddler age, right. or the toddlers getting older, just yes. enough to have things laying around the house right. to not really twist their arm too much, uh, but encourage them to make sounds? That's a, such a good question. And I, I'll share with you I've, my, my own personal Please, experience with right my ahead. son, who's now 10 years old and has is, is turned into this amazing composer and improviser at the piano. And he's also a cellist um, as well. Um, I tried to uh, sort of create an environment for him where that would be fertile for developing the ear gotcha. um, and uh, then a, a love for music. Because I think, you know, we, we all are naturally musical, you know, as human beings, we're naturally musical, but uh, some have uh, a more uh, clear ear than others. And I wanted him to kind of uh, to set him up the best that I could. So I very consciously surrounded him with toys that um, were musical and also that he could enjoy interacting with. Uh, so one of the things that was really important was that the toys that he played with had the right pitch. So if it was a C, on the xylophone or the toy, it was a C on the piano. And I also made sure to get to keep my acoustic pianos tuned. I had the tuner come in every six months or so and cut the pianos in tune um, so that anytime he would you know, mess around or uh, play, that he was getting reinforced with precision. precision. Yeah, exactly. So he had a little toy piano, a little, you know, that has those bells in them. But even though the tone's not the greatest on the toy piano, um, it was um, the, the right tone, though. He also had a little, uh, there's a circle bell toy. I mean, this is like a Fisher Price toy or something that uh, had colors on all the pitches. And that was a C through C. And, um, and I also made sure to have different sizes of xylophones, chromatic xylophones uh, that he would play around on. So the key thing with all that was, so he has this environment and kids like to bang on things, right? Um, so he would bang on those things, but I also um, would sing a lot of songs to him. But we'd also sing about mundane activities. So um, when, whenever I would be like, you know, right shoe, right shoe, left shoe, left shoe, I would just make up my own songs right. um, about numbers, about shapes, about um, pouring honey on his toast, uh, about, you know, uh, the shirt he was wearing, you know, just anything like that. We would to make it fun. fun. To make it fun. And he would start singing back to me then. And we would kind of have these little operas that, about mundane activities that we would just improvise. Um, and so then the other, but the other thing that I did consciously was that the song Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, because you hear it as the ABC song, it's also Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And a lot of toys play that song. Right. Right. So um, we, I was thinking like, and I was trying to put myself in his frame of mind that if he was hearing this song, and then eventually he's been banging around with this stuff. And eventually if I could show him that, oh, if you hit these notes, you will play that song that you've heard in the outside world. And that you, as a you know, small human, can make that song yourself. And when he did that for the first time, it was quite amazing. Because it was something kind of clicked. 
oh, I can make this. I can, I can make the song I've been making hearing. A song, right? Yeah, I can make that song uh, that I've been hearing in the world. And um, so, I, I, so that in terms of things that I have around the house, double check. I mean, there are a lot of piano keyboard uh, toys out there, but double check to make sure it's the right pitch. pitch. And if you have an acoustic instrument. Get it tuned uh, at least every six months. Keep more, it tuned. And, and, and understand that even though they're literally just banking like that right. on them, but they will remember those pitches. Um, uh, they have a much higher chance of getting perfect pitch developed when they're in that age group if, um, if those pitches are, are right. Right. Yeah. And um, a lot of times you had mentioned the one scale xylophone. Yeah. And young children. They'll learn colors before they learn. That's right. That's music. right. So like, that's right. They'll learn a song based on you know. Hey, this one here. Right. Like, or you're driving in the car and right. you hear a noise. Ding. They go, Hey, that's yellow. Yes. That, that's, that's They right. know it's the color. That's right. That's right. Bar. That's right. And right. That's right. really an amazing insight right. because mm -hmm. to know it's that one particular. Right. And there's mm -hmm. times you go and you check it. Go, Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Because usually that one is, is like the A440, yeah. which right. is a That's test true. pitch for a lot of things. That's right. Um, That's right. Interesting. So yeah. like uh, the next level up yeah. you get uh -huh. from like infant, toddler, uh -huh. and they have a lot of these beginners, about what age do you start, do, is great for recommending for, for piano Sorry, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say just a little teeny bit more about that okay. early stage because I want to emphasize we also did, you know, some kinder music classes and things like that. Um, and one of the things that's so important in these classes, is they'll gamify <clears throat> what they're learning. So it's fun and they don't, it's hard to tell unless you know what they're doing that it, it's hard to see that they're really learning things. But one of the other critical sides of things is developing their sense of pulse and rhythm. Right. That's cr so important. Because I remember when I used to teach, and the youngest I used to take was like six or seven. And some kids, you can be like a quarter notes, a beat, and this is a half notes, two beats. And some kids would be able to do it. Like you just, that was it. Some kids struggled with that. And if they struggle with it, of course, you work them through that. But there's like a, there's some windows where it's easier to pick up pulse and subdivisions of pulse. So those, that, those early times are just really, really critical for that kind of stimulation. So having said that, a kid that has had a good preschool teacher going to a really good beginner teacher, who's about six or seven, let's say, because part of his hand size, we were talking a little about hand size. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if, you're, if they're too small, they're going to get really, really frustrated um, at the instrument. And you don't want that experience to happen. Right. So, so of course, when they're really small, they're just banging around. That's, they're not going to get frustrated with that. But when you're asking them to manipulate the notes on the keyboard, they have to be a little bit larger. So six or seven is a great time to start. Um, I, I think I said in the last week, I started at age 13. I'm completely right. off the charts so, with that, you know. The standard question, <clears throat> how old were you when you could reach an octave? You probably started right. off reaching an octave. Oh, I started off reaching an octave. So, yeah, with my that, that, that's three. An yeah. If the first yeah. time you sat down to right. play and learned the piano, you could right. already reach an octave, man. Well, that helps. That, that helps. helps a lot. That helps a lot. No, that, no there's no doubt that, because I came in as a bigger person, I didn't have to go through that transition. The growing stage. Which, of which most people do. Stretching right? your right. hand. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I wish I had started way earlier. I mean, that, that's just like, uh, to this day, I, I wish I had started way, way, way earlier. And, and so if you have the chance, start earlier. This is the, the saying is, um, uh, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Right. The second best time to plant a tree is today. Right. So then, well, don't give up. Right. You know, I mean, if you, you know, if you, you don't have the option to go back in time, we haven't figured that part out, but just start and, and try to make up for those deficits. But, but yeah, so six or seven is a great time for the students to start at piano. I, and I really think that no matter what instrument they go into, um, if they learn the piano, it is so much easier to accelerate whether you're doing clarinet, voice, or whatever, you know. And that's not just because I love the piano. <laughs> it's true. You learn theory, chords. It's so much easier to understand uh, reading notation, things like that on the piano. So um, invest in at least a good, you know, couple, three years of beginner level lessons. And that's going to give you the foundation to go any direction you want, right. you know, and that is so critical. So, um, uh, and one of the critical things in that phase is also to be, be developing a sense of musical literacy. Now, musical literacy which what I mean by that is an ability to learn something on your own using 
you know, like like uh, reading literacy, English literacy. Right. I should be able to give you a book, and you can read the book and know what it's. Well, piano book. piano right. literature is something that's really studied. I mean, right. when you're, it's right. not just sit down and push the keys. Right. You got to spend a lot of time listening to recorded right. versions of this, right. taking in the 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 literature, right. looking at the notes, thinking that's a jump move. That's a. <laughs> I mean, you can right. tell it. If your fourth finger is going to be over the fifth, I mean, it's like that's, right. that's goofy. You got to get your thumb. I mean, because right. you just can't to learn all that sight reading is impossible. So mm -hmm. you have to really study the chart. And anyone that's ever had the performance piece knows. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided I was going to be a composer. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not going to write that music, right. but uh, at, at the same time, it's kind of like you said a starting point because I always noticed that. People that start off on piano, they a lot of times they excel on a solo instrument, like they become a great saxophone right, player or, right. or a great trumpeter or something. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's hard to be a great soloist on a piano. Mm -hmm. You just don't. It's hard to make a key sing. Well, that's true. A, a, yes. Other yes. instruments, you're actively right. the reason that's why true. they play one note. I mean, the right. thing is, like, you read treble or bass, right. so right. I read both. I play piano. Right. And so, like, right. as someone that only plays clarinet and mm -hmm. never learned anything, I was mm -hmm. like, wow, you got to learn other stuff. Right. Right. And right. so, for a piano player, it's hard mm -hmm. to get extremely lyrical in mm -hmm. singing. You have to work on those solo lines. Mm -hmm. Where in the clarinet, you can put, you can't add vibrato to it. I mean, you no. can't. You, you, you know, yeah, just go so loud and true. soft, and yeah. right. maybe people imagine when the orchestra right. swells. You, create, or, you yeah. create an illusion. You right. create a lot of illusion at the piano. Yeah. So, right. as your students are going through right. on, on piano, I, I do have a question. Do you yeah. have anyone that teaches? Like, and I'm guessing probably adults where they can play the piano without having to read music. Um, some, some, but even, even if you, I mean, like, um, if you're learning how to play like, uh, popular songs, you, you want to be able to read the lead, sh lead right. sheets lead and sheet. stuff like that. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so there is, um, I mean, there, there's, there's definitely things you can do without learning to read music. There's no doubt. It's just that it's kind of, um, uh, if you, if I was going to go to Mexico, and I had been studying conversational Spanish, but I'd never learned how to read anything in Spanish, I'd be kind of limited, you know? Like, like you'd want to know some, you know? And so, and we find that the people kind of get stuck. They sort of get, they get to a point where it's hard to bring them further. Right. Uh, right. But they can definitely, there's, I'm not trying to say they can't improve, because we certainly see that with adults. So I don't want to learn music, I just want to get better at this. It's just, that uh, it is easier to take their hand and draw them forward if they're open to learning right. some, some note reading. Right. Um, and certainly, if you have a kid <laughs> where, I mean, most people don't ask their kids, would you like to learn math? Would you like to learn how to read English? You know, you pretty much just learn it, right? You just, like, you're a kid, you're going to learn right. all these things. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why if you can get them to learn it kind of in that window where they're, learning their ABCs and their, you know, how to sentence structure and things like that in school. If you, if you kind of lump their music literature under, development into that group, right. they're going to they're gonna be, that's just something they'll know just like in all these other patterns. You know, music is a language. It is. And, and yes. there's some yes. core essentials to communicating that language mm -hmm. regardless of what the voice of the language is. It could yeah, be a piano, it could true. be a clarinet. Right. And so I guess the idea behind the piano is that a lot of voices in music historically mm -hmm. have been written and produced by on the piano so mm -hmm. you can hear a number of how the parts go together right that's it's right. the yes. whole idea yes. of being a great orchestrating thing right and like right. these notes aren't going to be on the piano i need the piano to get them to give them to the violin right the exactly violas. yes and yes. then yes. they may not sound good there i might need right. to replace them right with woodwinds. of course of course and so as you learn production and tone mm -hmm. Students learn that when they're on piano, and as mm -hmm. they're going through piano lessons, mm -hmm. they start learning that touch relates to tone, right? And that yes. the pedals mm -hmm. uh, start playing a point. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times in a story, you can tell how someone's playing experience is based on how they use the the sustain pedal. Oh, of okay. course. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. How much yeah. training or lack of right. it that they've right. had. Right. And has right. anyone ever told them that you know you got to discipline that right foot? It's not a gas pedal. It's not just go. <laughs> you know. Right. So, um, right. which brings me up to yes. you know we're right around the young ones, uh -huh. but in the middle age, they're say from six to ten, mm -hmm. somewhere uh -huh. around in there. And I was really thrilled when I saw this in your, yeah. in your recital uh -huh. hall because yeah. um, occasionally we'll get someone come in and ask for one of these, and I thought someone's got a serious student at home. 
Yes, that's right. That's true. Yeah, yeah if a parent is buying, a, this, a, this is called a pedal extender. If they're buying a pedal extender, then they have a great teacher who's told them to get a pedal extender. And they're also being a great parent to get them the pedal extender. Because one of the critical things with this is not the pedal part necessarily. It's, it's the fact that their feet are not going to be dangling from the bench. You're raising the floor. Raising to the floor to where their feet are. That is massively important. So if you're, if you're not, you know, in the market, if, you know, I mean, these are not cheap. But if you want to, they're, you know, little stools you can get that their feet can really stay on. And that's usually what we have people do first. It's usually when they really truly start using the pedal that we will have them get an extender. But, but I will strongly recommend that with, with a young kid who cannot sit and have their feet flat on the floor, you get them something where their feet can sit flat on the floor um, because the, pe- the piano is played with your entire body. And if you're, if you're off, you think mm-hmm. you th- you're, if your spine is in the wrong position, um, the kids are going to, they're going to compensate with their muscles and they're going to uh, tighten up in ways that's going to impact their ability to play. I think most of us have seen kids, you know, on YouTube or whatever, who are extremely fluid and facile at very early ages. And part of the reason for that is they're not blocking their physical movements. So if when we're tight, when we're off kilter, well, in order to maintain a body, you know, align and not fall on the floor, right. we will compensate in weird ways in the core and our hips and our leg muscles or whatever. So it will kind of clamp down to keep us from falling over, right? So if you have, if you have, a, if you're off balance, you know, on the on the piano bench, you're throwing off all of these um, things, and so then you're kind of like this, and then you're having to use muscular work. To play your fingers, which is which is not what you want, right? And and so then what happens is the student starts to associate playing the piano with something very uncomfortable Torturous. and very unnatural and very and very. This is not me, right? This doesn't feel good. Ergonomics are right. off. They can't. Ergonomics are off. They right. can't do it for right. more than fifteen. Exactly hours. right. And they, they won't be drawn because your body gets repelled. I mean, like think about like when you're sleeping. You don't want to sleep on a. Uh, high, uh, you know, like on a, on, a, on a board, you know, I mean, you want to sleep on something that's comfortable for you and it's different for different people. But the key is that you want to be, we're attracted as human beings towards comfort and we're repelled by discomfort. So it's something, uh, and, and people just forget about this all the time with their feet. Uh, the, it's the your bed. feet so flat it's, on Yeah, they got to be, they got to be flat on the floor. So, or on, on a pedal center. So that, so this just has the added thing of when you put this over your pedals, the student actually gets the experience right. of pushing a pedal down. They can practice their pedaling. I mean, they're not they're not perfect, but they work pretty darn well. Um, but these are so helpful uh, for um, young students. And then, of course, this this one's up at the highest level. It could be lower. And of course, once the kid is big enough, big enough. to use it, then you put it on. You know. You, you give it to your friends you give it or, or solve your friends, on. whatever, pass it on. But these are really, really you know, Everything yeah. Yeah. I, I, It's just funny because as you're talking and I'm thinking, that's everything I say at the store. Ergonomics mm. have to be right. You're gonna, people are going to be planning on sitting there for hours on mm-hmm. practicing. And then you try to tell your teacher students and even your teachers are teaching yeah. your students. And then they go home and they watch a Glenn Gould video where oh, he right, says all the fun stories yeah. like, Right. Everything you just said right. is thrown out the window, and this is. guy it's is true. critically raved right. about. <laughs> well, and he, and he, and let's talk about that. Let's talk because because um, there's you see that with um, Horowitz, you see it with Glenn Gould. Yeah, uh, all of those things are true. Glenn Gould did play extremely well. He sawed the legs off. So us. yeah, he did, and so and Horowitz does play incredibly well. That's all true. But what what you're trying, but what when you think about what are you, if you're going to decide what is going to help. 99% of the people that approach some, some task, be it basketball, swimming, or whatever thing you're trying to do, right? Are you going to go with the thing that does happen to work for that person, Glenn Gold, or, you know, Horowitz, or are you going to teach the 99% that thing? Works for and then, and then, as the, it's generally with, with that kind of thing, those kind of um, uh, tendencies or quirks if they're developing out of a foundation of strength and ergonomics, you can actually do that kind of stuff. That's the other crazy thing. I, I wasn't necessarily going to touch on this, but you brought it up. When you're accomplished, when you're comfortable, what's interesting, like when you're comfortable in yourself and you're, and you're secure, you can actually get to where you can play in really strange positions. For example, opera singers, 
Right. Okay. Now, when you're being trained to sing opera, you're sitting up and you're standing and da da da. Well, those opera singers have to lie on the floor while they're di they're dying. They're dying. They're dying. They're they're dying they're yeah, they have to act. They have to act, and they have to get all these funny positions. Well, what's happened is their core is so uh, attuned to what alignment needs to be there that even if they're lying on the floor, they're in a funny position. Internally, they've got it. You know what I'm saying? In yeah. that right thing. But you have to start with, uh, in a way, you have to be even better at the fundamental, the, the basics. Yeah, yeah. This is something I was I was going to talk about in the last the last video, but I want to hit on now because it's so important with this. Um, I think you said I forgot what, what you'd said that made me think of this, but I'll I'll just go with it. What I what I've noticed is when people um, really solidify the fundamentals that they will be, if they have the right teaching environment and the, and the motivation, okay, which, which if they have the right teaching environment, they do have the motivation, okay, that there will be an exponential growth at, at, at some point. So what will happen is you'll see this like, ding, 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 like hardly any growth, hardly any growth, hardly any growth. And meanwhile, people are taking shortcuts and it looks like they're doing really well, like maybe they learned a whole bunch of things that were too hard for them, right? But they sound really good right then. But what happens is those kids will get sort of stuck and if you start here and you really solidify this fundamentals, then they'll start to go like that. I mean, just like take off eventually. Because what happens is that um, our bodies and our minds and our nervous systems are attracted to things that work well. Okay, but you can you can you can game the system early, and you can get people to play things that are too hard for them. And sort of oh, oh I know right. that in right. piano, that's the biggest mistake a lot of teachers make. Right. They, they do. Like, they get this kid into Juilliard when he's twelve. Right. right. And the thing is that that maybe the kid. Well, he probably would. Well, that's a whole other <laughs> that was but, a joke. I mean. but, right. Yeah. But the thing is that what happens is that the they will they will adopt um, non ergonomic and non healthy things to make that work, and so they'll pay a big price for that. And and they may be very good at that one thing. But they won't have the ability to do everything. Right. And what we are trying to teach, I think, in music are excellent skills. How to be excellent, period. Using music as a vehicle for that. Right. So then you can be excellent as a lawyer. You can be excellent as a doctor, excellent as an airline pilot. Um, when you learn the skills of excellence, which is usually focusing on the, the, the boring stuff. Right. Um, and and but, but and, and then doing that and then eventually you will take off and it and it, it happens just the way it works you know so um, I think like with when you see parents getting something like this uh, you know that they have a good guide because that's what's also hard to know when you're sometimes when you're making this much progress you're actually making no progress you know right <laughs> sometimes right. you're just not making any progress at all and you don't know it's hard to tell right it's hard that's one of the reasons why why I think any music academy type place um, is, is and then there's also something called national certification for music teachers, which is also good, but find a teacher who is really good so that when you're in that phase, you know, which is hard to tell, right? You know, listen to some of the older students play, listen to the teacher play, listen to some of the, some of the results that they've had. Then, you know, you have a good guide right. you know, who's going to uh, draw you in a direction where you're not, where this this is not just normal. You're eventually going to have that exponential right. thing, right. right? So wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now you have um, <clears throat> at, at what point do the students identify themselves for like a competition? I've moved up in the piano world, and and uh, yeah. this is something I want to do. Or does the teacher ask them, "How do you feel about playing this in the competition?" That's a great question. Um, uh, I think of like competitions and festivals. So uh, I, I want to differentiate what those are. So a festival is an event that is uh, soft judged, meaning that every kid could get the top score. It's uh, basically judged on your personal efforts. You know, if everybody does A plus level, then they all get A plus. In a sense, like a class, right? If everybody got 100%, everybody got 100%, right? Um, a competition is where they're going to rank you and, and, and it's going to be much tougher because th th they're going to have to exclude some kids right. right from first place or second place or something like that. So the competitions, you have to be very careful about that because in the wrong uh, situation with that student, it could really be devastating. Right. Them, right. right. So, but what also happens is kids that went a lot, they do well in a lot of festivals as they get into their preteens and teens, they start to think of them as little kid things a little bit. And so they think, well, I want to 
test myself uh, on something harder. That's usually the best time to have them do a competition. But even so, within the realm of competitions, there are some that are just insanely competitive and some that are less so. So if you if you know kind of how to uh, structure it, what you're trying to do is kind of create these little challenges, little motivational challenges that along the way that uh, encourage the kid to keep moving forward. But I also would say that it's very important to learn how to not win something. You know, that's really important, how to not win. You know, now I'm not talking about not winning by, I, I'm just not gonna practice and not win. Hey, I, I succeeded not winning. I'm talking about learning how to handle frustration and disappointment when you've worked hard on something. Talk about a life skill. That's a very important, I mean, I haven't succeeded in everything. I've, I, maybe you have succeeded in everything. No, perhaps, no. You know, I don't know. You know. I've succeeded in very little. <laughs> okay. Okay. But I mean, you know, it's like learning how to, you know, take that emotional hit, be like disappointed, be upset, get that out. Because that's the important part, ignoring it, pretending, oh, it doesn't matter. No, it did hurt. It did hurt to I've not get that. Told right. It, it did hurt so bad. Yeah, and you have to let it, you have to go through that, and then also get to the point of like, okay, well, now I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna keep going. You know. So right. like resilience and grit, so important in life, right? So I think that like particularly if I have students, if I hear, I usually will ask them like, well, what do you want to be when you're when you grow up? And if they say, and usually they, they typically, they, I've never heard anybody say, I want to be. Well, maybe this, maybe that is wrong. They usually don't say something like, "I want to lie in a field and be fed, you know, bonbons." Ooh, right, you know, right. you know. They usually say something like a doctor. This is I'm not talking little kids. That's usually firemen or something. But like you know, they'll say a doctor or an engineer or something like that, right? Well, those are competitive fields. You have to pass a lot of tests. You have to. You have to. It is hard. It's hard to get a job. It's hard to keep a job. And then you have the pressure of your patients and your boss and all this kind of stuff. People that don't take music lessons or don't do a sport where you're individually you know, right. pushed, if you do not do that and you learn how to, you, and your first frustrations and, and failures are felt in college, that's devastating because you haven't learned how to deal with it. It's easier to lose with a team. And then you win. Right, 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 right. It's hard to start off as right. a tennis player and just right. get creamed all the time. It is, it is. You know? But it's very, it's very important to learn these things. It's in our lives. Like you said, learn important. how not to win. Learn like, how not to win. Someone someone did far better than you. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Be I mean, and yeah, and, and it's all I mean, learning to win is great. It, and I we love winning. I mean, I've always it's that the, the it's just that and in life when we when we win, we don't maybe spend a lot of time reflecting on that. But but what I'm saying is that um the it's almost the fact that when we don't win, there's almost more value in that if you learn the lessons from it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that that is such an important part of um, any any activity where it's you that's on that. You can't just say, well, my teammates are terrible. Right. right I lost because of right. the, those jerks, you know. Right. But no, no, you have to and, and, and you have to confront that there was a kid that that day. Yeah. The judges went their direction. I think that's very important. So, yeah, sometimes you know, it's kind of like. Um, athletic competition if you don't peak on that day when the right is that's at. exactly 100 I mean, getting that it's 100 percent. the thing yes. about piano competitions yeah. is they're never in one day there's right. always this day this day that's this right day. so it's like if you peak that first right. day everyone's intimidated on day two and three from you and that could be your worst days or someone right. else peaks and then you think right. I, I didn't think they had it in them Right, and right. then like you <laughs> thought you had the thing in the right. bag, and, and and it really is peaking as an athletic thing. It's yes. tied toward workout, yeah. toward water, toward diet, to yeah. current state of calories right. in mind. Right, and so much about presenting, particularly a piano program, mm -hmm. as one player to an right. audience is mm -hmm. even if it's just one song in a competition right. is it, it's stressful. It's extremely stressful yes. because you know you're in a room. Where at least there's a panel of experts that will notice your flubs and your mistakes. Oh, that's true. Yes, that's get, very true. Okay, it's one yes. thing if you're playing for you know in a bar with a bunch <laughs> right. of inebriated people. They, they don't care. Your know, mistakes right. are part of it. Uh -huh. uh, when at a competition, it's uh -huh. like they're really watching everything. Yeah. And then, then right. now they have the cameras. Right. And, right. and right. I, I don't think I could ever ever uh -huh. just go out and compete in that kind uh -huh. of kind uh -huh. of thing. Which reminds me, <laughs> how are you aware of about what percentage or how many students mm. you have that are putting in, say, um, around 
without fail, 20 hours a week. On this. Oh, um, it, yeah. I mean, because not all of them are, but no, I mean, no, you no, have no. some, some, there are a few, there are a few. I mean, we had one that just graduated who was definitely in that category. Um, I would say, I mean, very small percentage. I mean, that, I was that kid, you know, uh, most of our teachers were that kid when, when they were in school. Um, I mean, percentage wise, probably 3% or less, you know, that are, that are that dedicated. Um, and normally, you know, you can't, um, that, that's something that, uh, has to come from internal motivation. You know, the kid really has to want, I mean, for myself, it didn't, my parents didn't tell me you're going to practice five hours a day, six hours a day. I, I did that, you know, I, I, I chose to do that, you know, right. um, but, uh, uh, and it, I think that uh, it's a pretty pretty small percentage, um, and part of what I think is really important about what we're doing here is that every level of teacher they're really really good at what they're doing. So whether they're beginners or they focus on hobbyist students or they focus on the competition level level students, they're really really good at that particular thing. And the thing is that um, overall, we're not. I mean, I'm talking now from a community perspective, right? I also think we also want to have a vibrant musical community here in San Antonio and in our state of Texas. And we need people that are going to go to concerts and consume right. those, that, that, the product, that, right? The right. Listen. Exactly. So, um, and I know that anytime I've learned about something, whether it's painting or sculpture or whatever, or even martial arts, when you start to understand what they're doing, suddenly when you watch that or you listen, you, you get, get so much more out of it. New appreciation, right? You get a big appreciation. So for the students that are not in that twenty hours a week category, those are going to be people that will will um, be active lovers of music, you know, through their entire right. life, you know, which is really, really, in some ways, is almost more important. So a lot of the events we've been doing the last several years has been focused more on our what I call our middle eighty percent of students that that are um, that we're trying to kind of celebrate. And dig in with them and meet them where they're at and uh, give them things that motivate them. Some of those people will turn into those three percenters, right, right. you know. But but that's in a way where the real growth in our musical community can come from is that group of uh, people that are in it long enough to really you know have a feel for it. Um, but have um, but but there's a lot of years, you know, a lot of years and hearts in that group, and th and that's kind of. Uh, what we're focusing on now. In my own personal studio, when I was teaching all the time, I was pretty much demanding, no, you're going to be practicing like, you know, three or four hours a day. That was kind of my right. thing. But um, it's, uh, that's just because it was what I enjoyed, you know, teaching at that, at that stage. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to, I, I always think this yeah. is important, uh, at least in terms of, I don't know how well it's, how much it's used in education mm -hmm. of purposes, but I always tell people they come and they want to buy a metronome. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you want it for aesthetics? You know, to have it all right. set. And, I mean, that's great. You know, uh -huh. We have sure. it on our yeah. set. Yeah. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you can get a $50 keyboard with a built-in drum right. machine right. that doesn't make you count. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. Because music doesn't go like that. Right. Music right, right. is... Boom, kuh, doom, kuh, doom, right, right, kuh, right, right. Doom, right. Doom, yeah, 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 yeah. It's there. And it's easier to play Scott Joplin with a drummer than it is well, that's true. a clip. Okay. Yeah, it's easier to play yeah. even a Beethoven piece mm -hmm. with you know just a cymbal on mm -hmm. the drums, mm -hmm. you know, and that way there someone's keeping time for you. You don't have to do any math, right? And then, and I always tell people it's easier to play with a groove than it is with a count, right? Especially True. yeah, when a metronome is designed the way that they work to teach you to clap on one and three, mm -hmm. right? Right, which right. is just not right. Right, right, right. <laughs> so do you? Prefer a metronome or a drum machine or a beat? Well, it depends on what, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the metronome era, so I had a metronome. I, and uh, I use them as a, I, I do use a metronome occasionally, you know. My son, though, is, it's all the drum tracks and stuff like that. That's what he does constantly. I mean, occasionally when we were doing cello or if I was trying to train him up on a Chopin, a really fast Chopin piece or something, not that he's, he's not at that point yet. But if I was, uh, then I would use a metronome for that reason. Like if you're trying, if you, what metronomes are useful for on the classical side is the, on the athletic side, let's put it this way, on the athletic side, what they're very useful for is slowing you down. And although you could do that with drum machine as well, but slowing you down and to being able to um, sort of, yeah, slow time down so you can figure out what you got, what, what you're doing, right? right. Uh, now, 
if I was doing it today, like, let's say like me, if I was back to teaching full time today, I would almost definitely be more likely to find, use drum, drum patterns instead of the metronome because they do the same function. They do the same thing. They still slow you down, right? Uh, but they're, they're way more engaging, right? They're way more that's, engaging. That's, yeah. that's a yeah. great word because what yeah. it does is it takes your mind off of counting numbers. Well, when I never counted numbers to, with a metronome well, doing myself. Well, like, well yeah. when they teach it, you know, you had mentioned like yeah. you teach one, the half note, the whole note. Right. When you start right. teaching right. that, that's when people's eyes start glazing over. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this is starting to look like fractions. And I'm not right. there at school yet. I'm only oh, in second I see. grade. I see. I see. Right. Right. So it's easier to just say, go how it feels. Mm -hmm. If you're dancing someplace where it, there isn't a beat, mm -hmm. you're not right. So mm -hmm. when you're dancing your fingers on right. the piano, right. dance with the beat. And then it's easier to, to get a hold of a groove than it ever was. Right. To, is that on three or four? It's like, it's right here. Dun, 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 dun. Right, right. And right. once they can feel it, it's engaging. And so then they, they memorize it and they mm -hmm. can learn it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, slowing down is really, really important for, yes. you know, for particularly for piano players. Well, yeah, because it, there, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of fine motor skills going on there. And just like if you were learning, let's say, a complex dance or something, like physical, like you're talking about dancing, well, you'd, you'd want to be able to step it out, right? Right. Slow and take, or even like, and you say never a, step it out in time. Right. You're just trying to memorize the right, pattern. Right, right. And then you put it into, or I was, another example would be like, let's say uh, you're doing a film and you're filming a fight scene. You know, well, you're not going to, you're not going to go a fast fight scene, you're going to do a speed. slow. Right. You're going to do a slow and I'm going to do this and you're going to do this and then you're going to speed it up and then you're going to get it to where it's really fast and it looks amazing on screen, right? But but you're going to work it out because there's a lot going on, right? right? Um, but, I mean, these days, this, this, is what I, this is what I think on that topic. You use whatever you need to get it done. Make the connection. Okay, that's what it is. For the student so, to make Right, the right. Connection. Now for myself, but we all have a tendency to, to use what we used, used when we were growing up. That's why for me, I'm comfortable with metronomes. I got to work, I'm totally fine with metronomes. But for my son, he is a wizard at you know the keyboard. So, and he loves, he gets his drum, the drum things going and he finds a groove and then he'll create a, a song. I'm never going to come in and be like, here's a metronome. Yep. You know, that would be terrible. Well, he doesn't have, I'm assuming he doesn't have any timing problems. If he's got oh, no, he's great. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Uh, how yeah. many, okay, back right. up the clock. When you yeah. were first starting piano yeah. and learning, how many musicians that were playing piano and keyboards had, or guitar, had timing problems? Every single one of them. Right. right and right. now what I, the, the idea behind the drum machine is like, mm. it's so easy for someone to almost become like a natural musician just based mm. playing with the the apps on their phone or right their right true. putting things true. together right because it, it, it things are sent are they're they're more easily understood by people because well, you there's, know, a, there's an app for it or i an have a, i have i have a them. i think i know why that is I, i'm just throwing that this is i haven't I, I did not get a grant to study this but drumming is an ancient human activity drumming making beats right communicating through drums so it's been interesting to me too when i've gone through with my son i'm observing what he's doing and he'll find this really cool drum pattern, and I'm feeling it too. And I can come up with little song, little tunes start popping into my mind that are generated from that really good group. first form of music. I'm right. sure was drumming, yeah, just right. moving large blocks and right. moving things. You have to do right. it exactly. in coordination right. at the same time with right. So, groups. so, so, and they weren't, you know, this. They were, you know, they 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 were more complicated. Right. So, so anyway, so we respond to that on a primal level. So it, there's a connection there on a primal level that's very, very um, critical. But uh, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, I've had kids that have, over, that have been over metronomes and for them, I keep them away from the metronome for a long time. Right. But I still, I still, I still use it, uh, but, I, but yeah, apps are, I wouldn't get the TikTok. Those are usually inaccurate anyway. Well, yeah, so, yeah, I know, they yeah. can kind of wound get, up get a little funky, motor. yeah. Um, other things I, I wanted mm -hmm. to discuss a little bit because I've asked this of a lot of uh, teachers that just uh, whether they're I mean involved in all different kind of playing and, mm -hmm. and performance and, and uh, sometimes it's like an elementary school teacher or a, a, but the idea is and we had mentioned this I don't think it uh, we ever came to any resolution what are your thoughts on smaller keyboards that mm -hmm. are measured like 5.5 inches for an octave or 6.0 and 6.5 yeah I think that those are awesome 
I, I actually played, I got to play on some of those that were retrofitted to uh, acoustic instruments. And it was really interesting how quickly I adapted to it. It was, it was I was thinking it was going to be really hard. And it wasn't initially, like for the first few seconds, but your brain just kind of goes, oh, okay, you know. And, uh, but, but there are people, so many people with smaller hands that are adults too, mm -hmm. that are, that get injuries. I mean, it's kind of, in a way, uh, crazy to me that we don't have more options for small handed people and for kids, just like with this, you know, if you could have the right setup for a child, you know, the right uh, keyboard setup so they, it was similar to what they would feel when they're bigger, that would be massively helpful um, and much more engaging, right? And, um, and I, I mean, I'm, I, I just, I, I know there are logistical challenges I, 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 that are probably much bigger than I can imagine. Right. But yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, most things in life these days, I'm trying, I'm thinking about when they made, when Henry Ford made the Model A, they pretty much made probably one, I don't know if the seats were adjustable, you know, but these days, most things you go get into, your seats Have adjustable, kind of adjustment. you've got some way to make it work for you. And it's com more comfortable and it's more, again, engaging. Engagement is so important. Engagement is emotional, mental, intellectual, it's also physical. It has to, you have to feel right. good, right? Or you'll be repelled by, by whatever it is, right? So I, I'm, I would love it if there were more of those. Yeah. Well, I think I've read a couple of articles and, and I just think it's kind of unfair because there are students that are already at much younger ages mm -hmm. to play the more sophisticated it's true. pieces yeah. that have tints in right. it, yeah. uh, with octaves and notes right. in the middle yeah. and both hands. Yeah. And uh, when you realize the number of piano teachers in the world that mm -hmm. are for the most part female, mm -hmm can't really right. reach a that's tent. True. That's and right. they're teaching students that, that can barely reach an octave. Right. And that's almost like all of the good creme de la creme de la literature is mm -hmm. kept away from them almost deliberately right. based on there's right. no rule that says it has to be a 48 inch no, 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 A no. to C right. keyboard. No, no. And, and to shorten that thing, yeah. I think what people are afraid of is to have far more successful pianists at an extremely young, smaller age. Oh, with, it's with possible. I, I just, my feeling is that and maybe it's because I'm not in the pianist business myself in terms of right. me being a right. performer right. anymore. I, I'm more in the business of wanting a community of musicians out there. So therefore, I like that idea. Like, bring it on, you know? Like, well, let's have more people. Because usually what it is to me is like the music itself is not as engaging in those early years. That's why, that's why like, the students are not necessarily getting a lot of pleasure out of playing some of those beginner-level pieces. It's usually once they hit pre-adolescence or adolescence, then the music takes them over. And that's when it's, that's an amazing thing. But, but that would happen earlier. Earlier, because yeah, they can hit right, the keys. Right, they can get the keys. You, you know, the, in fact, that one of the things that's so critical with an early teacher, a teacher of the six to eight year old, the beginners, is the teacher has to be able to personally, has have to have the charisma and the engagement skills, the soft skills to, to make that motivational. But once, once they get, once the music takes them, once the music, once they are playing because they want to play, that is That's when magic. it gets obsessive. That's when that's, you're looking at amazing. a kid that's yeah. putting in seven, eight hours right. a day and, and you're trying to find a way to get out of the house. Right. No, honest. I, I, I mean, I, I uh -huh. was one of those. I, right. I just couldn't do it enough. And when someone mm -hmm. gets bit by that bug and there's right. no digital pianos around, there's no yeah. headphones. Right. I mean, it's you hear it or right. they stop. Right, right, right. Uh, it's, right. it's a better world now because people can can just, you know, practice all the time. And, right. And most true. of that is you're well aware when you're mm -hmm. learning and memorizing and stepping through the steps. Yeah. Privacy so you can focus. Oh, it's huge. It, yeah. It, it, big time. It, yes. It's everything. Yeah, definitely. What else can I ask, or why don't you just tell me what I'm missing? Because there's so oh. so many things about teaching in here at your school, and I and I like the approach because it's all mm. personalized. It is, for the yeah, students. it's all personalized. And, yeah, I, I would think the thing I keep coming back to is that we we know that I, I te the first teacher is most important. That's one one critical thing, and that also that not every student learns the same. So what what works with one student. And, and uh, even they're in the same family, is not going to work with this, the other student. And so it can be sometimes hard to know, like, well, what's the right teacher for my child or myself, right? Without trying it. You do need to try it, and you do need to find someone who you feel 
a connection with. I think that's very important, whether, whether it be an athletic trainer or a coach of some kind. Right. You want to feel some kind of connection, some caring there. And also, you want to have a sense of what their results have been over time. Um, but I wanted to mention one other thing. I didn't get this a lot of you. I want to do a quick shout out to, you had asked something about, um, this is really skipping <laughs> topics, but uh, you, you had said something that I should appreciate it about how I'm not sitting here, you know, working the, all the levers at Maxa all the time. And I, uh, and what, uh, and the reason for that is that we, we really try to develop leaders in our organization. So uh, Evelyn Escobedo, who's our COO, has been with us since the very beginning. She's been amazing, so helpful, and I'm so grateful for her. Um, and we have Pam Fisher and also uh, now Pam Rodriguez, that's her uh, married name, uh, and Tom Vela, and many others have been just been uh, incredibly important. So we, we try to develop uh, leaders in the organization. That's the key with that. When, when I started this, I was thinking that, you know, well, we have, we're going to, this is a business organization based on, Teaching, well, why can't we? We also have to be learners. Teachers have to be learners. And we also have to continue to teach ourselves and also um, everybody in the organization. We're not, we're all, we, we are, when we're, when we're stagnant, we are stuck, right? And so we always have to keep challenging ourselves. So to get back to something from the last interview, that's to recap that. Um, in terms of um, what else uh, I would say to, to recap, mostly for people to take away. Spend the time to test out some teachers until you found that right right one. I can't emphasize that enough. Right. If you if in anything in your life, if you uh, I use, usually use Mount Everest as an example, an extreme example. Um, find a guide who's been up Mount Everest before, or at least the part that you want to go on. Right. You don't have to summit. You might just want to go to the bottom. That's fine. But find find someone who you trust and who will who will work with you and adapt to your style. And uh, especially in the beginning stages, once the kid is bitten with the music, once they're going, that's almost when you could you can get a teacher that's less good at teaching and okay coaching. coaching, right, right, because this the, they're like the, uh, the they at that point they they uh, provide their own right yeah they're self learning they're right, the right. self talk right you're right. just keeping you're on helping with that. you're they're right. their guide and no and no and it's important to know when to switch because sometimes people will stick a little too long in the comfort of somebody who's um, a great teacher, and they may at that point need somebody who's more of a coach, performance-oriented, which is what my specialty was before, was like getting them, once they were bitten by the bug, then I'm going to help them reach their full potential. Right. Right. But that relationship is very different than the relationship you, you want in those early stages, where it's more about, what I usually say is there's a part where the people are more important than the music, Person's more important than music in the early stages, for sure. And then there's another time when the music is more important than the people. And that's where, the, if they're performing a lot. Right. Uh, and and that's, that's where it's like, you know, you owe it to your audience to do the very best that you can. And you need, have to know where to switch. Right. That. Yeah. Well, Ken, this has been wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your, about your time. The, the philosophy it. behind yeah. all of the teaching method. And uh, thank you very much for your thank time you. and, um, and dedication to listening to this conversation with Ken Thompson here at Musical Arts Center of San Antonio. Thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to seeing you in the future here on this channel along with Ken. I think I'm going to be doing some more of this It'll stuff. It'll be fun. This was a It'll lot, be a lot of, fun. of fun. Thanks so much, Ted. For, Al for Alamo Piano Galleries, this is Ted Barsley. Thank you so much for your time. We'll see you next time.